Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us and spending these Thursday afternoons with us. We do realize that you could have been anywhere else, but we're so glad that you're here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. My co-host and colleague, Ms. Susie Molina, is not here with us today, but uh, surely we are in great hands uh, and we will continue to move forward, forward uh, with this webinar series. I do want to uh, mention to you all again that if you register and attend all five webinars, um, you will be invited to the in-person session um, on December 7th, and you will receive a certificate. So uh, please keep that in mind. But again, you have to register um, and attend all five virtual sessions in order to receive the certificate. So having said that, um, we have a very phenomenal um, speaker with us this morning. She was our first speaker for this Women in Construction series, um, and she's back again. So you'll see her uh, throughout this workshop, as I mentioned, uh, this virtual workshop, as I mentioned previously. Um, she's certainly no stranger to the construction industry, um, has her own company, and is doing extremely well. So I want to absolutely uh, present to you all Ms. Rebecca Reyes of Beck Tech Construction Resources. Um, and she's, like I said, she's back again and here to um, talk to us today um, about going from a sub to a prime. And we know that that is hard work uh, for men in construction, let alone women <laughs> uh, in construction. So, Rebecca, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you. I am um, really proud to be here uh, with all of you. It just astounds me when I see the numbers that log in to this, these webinars, and it just, you know, warms my heart. Um, I um, am going to start out with a little story. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, when the housing crisis uh, slammed into Houston, there were many contractors in the housing market that came to a screeching halt. Uh, you know, there were porn driveways, uh, you know, building houses, you know, plumbing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they immediately put play, uh, put in play their plan B. And what they essentially went was from a subcontractor to a prime, prime contractor. And they went from private work to public work. So an important factor to know is that when the economy is wonky, inevitably the government comes in with infrastructure to, to boost the economy. This is historically a fact and it is happening right now as we speak. Uh, it would be great if we could have that all in a giant list and say, okay, where's all this money going to so we can shoot for there. But th this, is, this is part of the learning process that you, that you will build from becoming a sub a subcontractor to a prime, prime contractor. Let's just say a sub to a prime and that way I won't have to say all those words. Um, and you're asking, well, how did they do this? And um, I'm hoping that this is what we're gonna try to talk about today. And a good part of that is of course your bonding capacity and how you obtain it. And you know, th this these little numbers that have uh, the sections that I have below, you know, the CPA review, a compilation of your financial statement, income, balance sheet, work in progress report, personal financials, resume, and you're like going, why do I have, I don't even have all that. How do I get all this done? And I think that insurance is our key factor. I, I got a couple of emails asking me about insurance. And of course, uh, that's a hard thing to do. It's, you know, I talked to you in the beginning about having partnerships, you know, your insurance, your banking company, uh, you know, your CPAs. These are people that all play roles, different roles in your, uh, in your business, but you need to, you know, you're going to shop them around like you shop around for doctors or like you shop around for the right price for a car. <clears throat> there is an insurance company out there for you. And a lot of the smaller uh, uh, companies, like, for example, let's, let's go back to the housing industry. They probably were carrying a good general liability insurance. In other words, one of their employees fell, broke his leg, uh, 
you know, they back their tractor up into the house and they're going to, so that, that is what a general liability insurance covers so that they, um, you know, don't come after you personally or come after your business. And hopefully most of you are all set up on some kind of a business structure, a limited liability, an S corp, a corporation, but, but once they got that general liability insurance, they created a foundation, a relationship. So the insurance company looks at them and says, you know, you're good for it. Let's work further. Um, can we get to, to the next page? And so that is where your resume falls in place and where, sorry to keep referencing them, but referencing this housing market, they were able to put together a resume. They were able to say, this is my company. These are the 20, 30, 10 people I have working for me. Um, these are the jobs that we've done. This is how long we've been doing them. We've had no injuries. We get, we pay on time. We, just your resume communicates who you are and your experience. This is vital for uh, you requiring bo a bonding capacity. But more importantly, it's it's important for you to start doing this today with your simple general liability insurance. And, and you may have to appeal to your insurance company with this resume. You know, talk about you personally. You know, we opened up the, the business at this time because we've always wanted to be in the business or because we have an entrepreneur heart in our system and this is what we really wanted to do. So think about developing your resume. Just think about jotting down, you know, you participate in your church, you uh, have an excellent estimator, you have an excellent truck driver, you have a, an excellent accountant, you have good uh, accounting software that you maintain uh, all the time. So I think that it's important for you to start establishing this resume because this resume is gonna keep taking you further and further in. Um, you know, talk, once again, talk about your estimator software, time management, and, and what type of construction. So next, we're gonna talk about um, your financials. And so you're gonna need to put together your personal financials, and all this may be redundant to you, but there are things on financials when you put together a financial statement for your business, more importantly, in your personal life, you've got all kinds of financials. You've got a financial statement for your bank. You have a financial statement for your insurance company, your bonding company, the people that give you uh, all of your working capital insurances. And then you have a financial statement for the IRS. So it's important that you keep and, and market all of these things. So personally, they want to know how are you as a person? You know, how much money do you have in the bank? Do you have a savings account? Do you own a home? Do you own cars? And in that financial statement for your personal life, you need to put the fair market value of if you were to sell it today. So let's say you bought a house for $150,000 eight years ago when life was good and there were actually $150,000 houses out there. Well, today, that $150,000 house is probably a more around $350,000 to $450,000 house. So now you have a $450,000 asset on your balance sheet. That speaks volumes to them because worst case scenario, that's where you're going to become liquid. That's what they want to know what your assets are, what kind of loans you've given. If you've loaned people money or if you've loaned other, you know, put them down as an asset. They're collectible. Your notes payable. You know, what you what is your mortgage payment, your car payment, any other kind of those kind of payments. They do ask you what are your credit card balances and any other personal kind of balances. You need to keep those at a very low balance. In fact, you shouldn't even ever have a balance on a credit card uh, because that tells them, okay, they're charging everything. They're paying at least anywhere from 19 to shoot 21, 27% interest on those. 
this isn't good management because they're carrying too high of a balance on their credit cards. And so uh, what you're going to do is you're going to subtract the total of all the great assets that I just told you to develop. You know, if you own a boat, what's the, the uh, value of your boat? Just, you know, think about things. Think about things that have value to you that you can list on there. Jewelry, watches. You know, what do you place value on? If you were to like sell everything, this is what I could get for everything today. Not yesterday, not when you bought it today. And so if you subtract all of your assets from all of your liabilities, it tells you your net worth. This is what I'm worth. So I've just paid, let's say your mortgage payment is $1,000 or $2,000, but you paid $150,000 for that. Well, you subtract 450,000, which is your current value of, of your house, if you were to sell it today, minus what you owe on the mortgage, you got a pretty good net worth. That speaks volumes. That tells them, okay, this person is sound personally. Uh, let's move forward and let's talk about the business. Of course, you know, they also want to know about your personal cash flow, which is you know, how much is your paycheck coming in and how many bills are you paying a month? Are you sustaining life properly? You know, are you able to buy, do you have money left over for groceries and kids and et cetera, et cetera, versus always in the red? So manage that properly as well. So now they're going to look at your business. This is a completely different financial statement. So you've got in your list of assets, you've got your cash savings account, all of your accounts receivables, and then of course, again, property. You know, do, do you own the property where your office is at? Do you uh, own uh, trucks, which personally, you probably should, all of your vehicles for your personal family should be owned by the company. I mean, you're going to be driving back and forth to the company. So your company should own all of your vehicles. You don't need to own your personal vehicles. Your com Now that you have a company, you can write that payment off on your company, but any of your equipment and you need to put down, if you haven't already established a financial statement, when you first establish it, you can use the fair uh, market value of when you start your financial statement. Uh, the work in progress under billings and the, these are costs that far exceed the billings. Some of you may not be work, using a work in progress and basically what. So, the IRS, the, we need to have a whole seminar on a work in progress report because it is really important. And I, I think I explained this in the beginning. The IRS said contractors are notoriously criminal, so we're going to make it difficult for them to cheat on their taxes. We're going to create a work in progress that makes an assumption of what their revenue is, and they base revenue on cost. And that's where this underbilling, so basically you spent uh, $2,000 on this job, but you only invoiced because of the job of the things that you did, you only invoiced $500. So they're saying you've got too many costs that you didn't invoice. So we're going to assume that that is an invoice that you're going to further build. And they're going to, it becomes an asset. So if, if once, uh, is a whole math configuration on that, which I will love to explain it all to you. I've created an entire spreadsheet on it that tells every box. It's a, it's a complicated procedure, but that is the way the federal government sees you as a contractor. Um, also under your assets, you'll get a drop in there that I forgot to mention It's in your revenues and what your net income is. It drops over to your your uh, uh, balance sheet as well. So then you've got your liabilities, notes payable. Do you have a line of credit with the bank? Um, then of course, now you've got, you build the customer a thousand dollars, but your cost was only $200. It's like, hey, you're cheating. You really didn't do that work. 
because you're running this job at a 7% markup. And so there should be 7% markup worth of costs matching this. And so they put it down as a liability. They're saying, you're going to have to pay someone back that money because you don't have the costs to uh, allow for that billing. All this washes out in the end when the job is complete, but it's still a part of your balance sheet. And then you have your long-term notes payable, which is, you know, your property, your land, your building, your equipment. But they also want to know what your current portion of all that is. So you have to add up what the 12 months of all those notes payable are. And you subtract it from your long-term uh, billings. So they want to know this is current billings, a uh, current portion of liabilities my, minus current earnings. And that gives them your cash flow. So they'll be able to say, wow, you are doing amazing. You've got enough cash flow here to pull you through for the next three months. Right on. We want to insure you. You've got plenty of work and capital. You've got great cash flow. I love your financial statements. I think you're an incredible human being. But I tell you what, since this is the first time we're going to do this, why don't we start you out with a, you know, $500,000 bid bond. So they're telling you, you can only bid on jobs under $500,000. You can't bid over $500,000. But, you know, so anyway, so that that is basically what I'm telling you is you've got to look at your financial statements. You've got to put your corporate financial statements together and look at what your cash flow is, how to create your, your working capital. These are, this is part of your entire resume. And basically what all these numbers do is tell them that you are functioning. Because if they come out upside down, or let me use my favorite word these days, wonky, they're gonna go, yeah, we really can't afford to bond you, but hey, you're doing really good. That means something's wrong with your financial statements. And, and you know, to be honest with you, if someone does talk to you about that, just look at them and say, tell me what on my financial statement that I need to fix. And have them walk you through it. And if they can't, then you shouldn't be working with that insurance company. Because the point is, is it's a partnership that you guys are working together. They need your business as much as you need their business. They want you to succeed so that they can give you a $5 million bond. That makes more money for them. And and they just, you know, most importantly, they do. But, but you know, going from a prime to a contractor, those guys in the housing market, uh, my company was in 2008 when I saw that this was all coming through and, you know, Texas was the last, the last state that got hit. But, you know, it's what, seeing what was happening, it was like, you know, your mind starts spinning and you sit there and you pull your line of credit. You're not sure what's going on with the bank. You've got to get a lot of backlog in. You're not sure what's going to be happening in the billing. Um, you know, you have to take a hard look at all of your numbers. And what they did was they had their resume, they had their financials, they went to a bonding company. In that time, we were bidding against maybe four, five different contractors. In 2009, there were at least 15 new, brand new contractors bidding for the exact same job. They all just fluctuated into the public sector to bid on paving jobs, concrete jobs, sidewalk jobs, you know, any kind of, you know, roofing, anything they needed to do, they got in there. And it, it was a battle because they drove the market percentages really low, but hey, they needed to work. So I am sorry, but good for them. I was really glad that they were able to have, to put their financial statements together that insurance companies saw that they were 
they were valid and, and hardworking people and said, hey, you can't bid on jobs more than a million dollar job or a $2 million job, but they raced to where they needed to go. So they came from being a subcontractor to a, a prime contractor in the snap of a finger. I mean, it was, it hit hard. People just stopped working. We're going to stop building houses. You know, people's, it was bad. I don't know if any of you guys remember this, but it was bad. And these guys just like said, okay, cool. Here's our financial statements. This is what we're going to do next. This is a plan B. When you talk about diversification, when you talk about, you know, well, I'm just a roofer. Don't just be a roofer. See if you can build a fence. See if you can put in windows. See if you can pour concrete. It's okay. You might be able to do those kind of things, but because you have built a resume, a financial statement, and to be honest with you, that's all they're asking for. They want to know, just like a bank, when you go into a bank to make a loan, which is so hard to do, and I really don't like doing it. It would be really nice if somebody would smile, and, but they want to know your character, your capacity, and your capital. Who are you? What have you done? And, you know, how much money are you really keeping and making your, you know, providing it for your company, paying your employees, paying your bills on time, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down the food chain. I know this is a, a, a small, uh, I think I'm supposed to speak till 1230, but I'm pretty much wrapped up there. If there are, you know, well, here's your income statement for your corporate. You've got your income, um, which is you know, the revenue that you're billing, uh, less your cost of goods sold, and that gives you your gross income. And this is where your whip under and over billings comes in because federal government is saying, take it out of your income. You cannot use that as income because based on how your whip is reported to us, or you've got to put it in your income. You have to add it to your revenue. So uh, then you have your expenses, which are depreciation on every automobile that you have, you know, trucks, you know, um, you know, all your cars, uh, any equipment, if you buy computers, if you buy desks, if you buy uh, anything for your office can be depreciated. And it's just a once a month expense that, so let's say that you build a uh, million dollars, let's go big. You build a million dollars, it costs you $500,000 to build that revenue. You're gonna be paying taxes on $500,000. Well, no, you're not. You're not gonna do that. We can't do that. We've gotta come down to the expenses and we've gotta use depreciation. All of the interest that you pay on all of your notes is an expense for your business. So when you pay the note, to reduce the note that you have on your financial statement, if it's two thousand dollars, post the one you know thousand fifteen hundred dollars for the principal, and then come over to your expense on on your income statement and deduct that interest. You can't deduct the note, but you can deduct the interest, which in turn is added back in when you create cash flow. So all of these non uh, what do you call them, non-liquid uh, expenses, they get re-added re back in once you need to prove working capital, cash flow, because it's that's not really money that's coming in and out. So it doesn't affect your financial statement, quote unquote, for your insurance company. But it does affect your financial statement for your bank and for the IRS. And they're the financial statement category is quite complicated, but it's important that you allow it. So then you subtract all that and your net. Now you've made $100,000. So you're only going to pay taxes on $100,000 because you've got payroll and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in actuality, you're pretty profitable. You've got a good uh, percentage markup on your business. Um, anything else I need to talk about? Is there, this is it. Just I wanted you guys to see this and be able to read what working capital and cash flow are. So this is part of your resume. These are part of the things that. So here's your 
this is, you know, how to create your cash flow. So you have your net income, you add in your depreciation, add in interest, you subtract your current liabilities and they'll like go, wow, you're doing really good. Or, oh, um, hello, you need to be billing more and you're spending too much money. You have no cash flow. Bonding companies, that is the first thing they look at is your cash flow. They will they will make you sell equipment. <laughs> it's like you've got way too much equipment on your on your books to be billing that much. You need to bill more to withstand how much equipment you're carrying. And then there's the calculation for working capital, which you know these numbers also come from the work in progress from the work in progress report, uh, which I would love to share with you guys at some point. It, it's a cookie, it's uh, complicated, not a lot of people understand it, but it's a fact. You have to do it, just like you have to go to the dentist. <laughs> you gotta go get your teeth cleaned. <laughs> uh, any questions I can answer? Um, let's see, I am going to ask my uh, team member, Ms. Deirdre Sutton, to um, come off mute and check the chat for me so we can okay. go through our questions. I see it's been an active and very lively chat. Yes. Um, I just haven't been reading them. Okay. Um, uh, the first question is, what is the three C's? Oh, it's character, capacity, and capital. Okay. It's, it's building your resume. Okay, no problem. All right. Um, do you have a pre-qualification process for subs? You don't, you don't need to, well, well your pre-qualification process is when you be, want to become certified to be an MWBE, an MBE, a small business, that, that is, so the conversation that I just had with you is that you are none of those things. You are not an MWBE. You're you're right. just a business person doing really good for yourself, no. and you've decided I want to play with the big boys. I, this is what you're going to need to do. I think you're going to need to get bonded. I think it's in relationship to being a subcontractor with your organization. Oh, I see. Yes. No, I don't have one yet, but I will get one. Okay. <laughs> But I look, guys, I'd be more than happy to spend time mm -hmm. to mentor you or, um, you know, help you along the way. Been there, done that. Okay. And what type of organizations are you actively participating with? I am not actively participating with any other construction uh, uh, industry. I get a lot of calls mostly from uh, people that are working in the, you might could say, the Office of Business Opportunity. How can we better access that for ourselves? And believe me, I've been working with the county in the city and telling them things are awry and we need to change them. And, uh, so I'm not really connective. I think I was doing so much of that that it, I really focus on on targeting uh, issues like that. I've spent a lot of time with Marsha Murray at the city of Houston and, you know, wanting to have conversations with her about subcontractors. I want to know who the small businesses are. Don't talk to me about the primes. I don't want to know who's working and who's not working. I wanna know about the small businesses that the office is working with. I've had the same conversation at the county and at the Port of Houston. Uh, Metro is on my list as well. Okay. And I've had these conversations with the state as well, the, the state controller's office. Okay, thank you. Um, one question, would you recommend multiple bank accounts to manage these financials? Uh, bank accounts do not manage your financials. Okay. Um, I, I, I always think, I always think it's good for, you know, keep your savings account here and keep your working capital account there. 
But the key part of, of your banking is creating a relationship. You need to pick up the phone and say, hey, Becky, you're my banker. This happened. This is coming across my table. Wow, this would be a huge opportunity for me. But, you know, my line of credit short. Okay, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to help you with your line of credit. Bring me in your financial and let's talk about it. That's a partnership. That's the same partnership that you have with your CPA. That's the same partnership that you have with your lawyer. And, you know, you don't pay them every day, but you do have to pay them and you do have to have them. So building your financial statement is, is about having the, a good software to be able to, to do that with. And, you know, maybe that's an opportunity that, okay. that we can talk to as well about. Yeah. Well, I was thinking in my mind that, you know, some, a lot of our companies have the payroll separate um, from the business checking account. And right. some of them may have a business savings account because they're trying to expand or, you know, buy equipment or something for cash flow. But I think maybe that's a structure um, that is advisable if you're trying to get clean lines for your accountant who can, right. you know, <clears throat> advise you on your expenditures in the different, you know, bank accounts. Uh, right. It depends on if you're doing your own payroll or if you have a service doing your payroll. Mm -hmm. um, so that, 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 that's a, you know, I've done that, uh, you know, hire a service, take care of our payroll. Mm -hmm. The problem that brought for me was I'm running five jobs. All of those expenses, all of those payrolls, everything that goes on that truck allowances, uh, their insurances, those yeah. job costs and it was really hard for that payroll ser uh, service to separate all that for me so what we ended up doing is is getting a software that all we did was clock in time for the jobs I mean, look ai is is a big part of our world now technology is a big part of our world now that's so simplified and most of these construction softwares you can you can integrate your payroll where they just send in all the hours. And once they're into your software, it goes directly to that job. And that's an expense for that job. It's a, a direct labor cost. There are other costs where you have to pay the insurances. So I don't know. I think hiring payroll, not, not that I'm one. Oh, no, I think that was very valuable insight. Yeah. yeah. I, that, you know, you, there are ways to manage it now that's more cost effective and um, user friendly because, right. you know, a real small business is looking to save money and do things right. So that right. was, a, I think that was an excellent reply. Um, okay, Becky, what is the best way to connect with you? It's Follow on the screen. Or email? Yeah, it's on the screen. All they have what, to do is which way? Yeah, which is the most preferred, I guess. To Either. Oh, okay, you don't have a preference. Right. Okay. Um, Steven said, bankers like to have the complete relationship and sometimes they base pricing for loans and saving, saving rates on the full relationship. I think, um, I think he was basically talking about how the relationship with the banker can get you better pricing or um, for your savings or loans? I have no idea what Stephen was talking about. Okay. Um, no problem. Um, that, is, that is a, you know, interest rates are interest rates. Right now they're horrible. They're just stinking horrible. Exactly. But, There's no help. <laughs> just, you have to just do your best. To tell you, let's put this, hundred thousand yeah. dollars in a CD at our mm -hmm. bank that pays you 9% interest, then we're going to give you a line of credit that charges you an 8% interest. So you're going to just like wash those two. Not only is the bank and your financial statement changing, 
But if you're paying an interest of 8% on a line of credit, you've got a savings account, which is either a CD or a money market account. You know, you don't have access to it, but it, it's still working for you because it's gaining 8% interest while you in turn are paying a 6 to 7% interest. And so you're washing out there. There's 1% of of good liquidity in there that you're really not using because I need a line of credit. What can I do to get a line of credit? All right, that's what we're going to do. We're going to put you in a money market or a CD that's paying this interest. Then we're going to give you a line of credit for that exact amount. So the bank's happy. We know we can get my money, their money from your line of credit. But now the bonding company knows you have a CD for $100,000 and you have a line of credit for $100,000. That's all they want to know. You know, basically washing it out there. And that that's, again, what I'm trying to tell you is that there's a financial statement for your bank. There's a financial statement for your insurance company. There's a, you know, once you get to start paying, you know. Okay. Of, yeah. I, I get it. It's really working closely to the banker and getting the best options for you. Right. Yeah. And, you know. They, they, know they, they know their parameters, so they, they, it's easier for them to advise you and guide you. So that's... I, I think, thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that was it for our questions. Yeah. Um, I did want to remind everybody that um, some of you may have received a flyer, and it has a date of Thursday, November 23rd. That's Thanksgiving. So um, we will meet on Thursday the 16th, which is next Thursday. And then after the 16th, the next meeting will be on Thursday, November 30th. So please make that correction. Um, I definitely don't want you all to log on on Thursday, the 23rd, because nobody will be here. Um, but again, we do next uh, Thursday, we'll uh, talk about and lay out a lot of our Houston Community College resources. Um, you don't want to miss that one. That's going to be good. And then the following meeting, is again Thursday, uh, November 30th. So please make that correction if you have received a flyer that has a uh, Thursday, November 23rd date on it. Um, Rebecca, again, you did a phenomenal job. Uh, you made some great points. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I don't see any more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, yeah, these are comments. And Okay, wonderful. So um, thank you again. We're giving you guys some time back this afternoon. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We look forward to seeing all of you um, next Thursday when we talk about and lay out uh, our Houston Community College resources. Again, uh, Ms. Reyes' contact information is on the screen, so you can screenshot that, take a picture of it, um, and get in touch with her if you like. And in the meantime, look for more information from the Houston MBDA, and we will be right back, same channel, next Thursday at 12 noon. So thank you all so much. Have a fantastic afternoon.